rise up, rise up, rise up. They say it's to protect you while they try to dispossess you of the right to decide between wrong or right. To openly discuss what politicians hide. They want to keep their secret plans from the public eye. We gotta keep our fires burning, keep our spirits bright. We gotta rise up, rise up, rise up. Rise up, people, against the war. Rise up, people, against the war. Rise up, people, against the war. Rise up, people. Money got no children. And bombs ain't for building. Killing ain't no way to make a peaceful day As all of God's children can easily explain We gotta keep our fires burning, keep our spirits bright Stand up and speak for what we know is right We gotta rise up, rise up, rise up Rise up people against the war Rise up people against the war Rise up people against the war Rise up, people, I see days ahead, kiss my children into bed, all across the planet I see that everything is Against the war, rise up people against the war, rise up people. We have the power and the will and we'll do it for our children. For the warmongers and the corporate whores in the history books with the dinosaurs. I claim my power, I claim my rights. And no dirty tricks are gonna change my mind I'm gonna rise up, rise up, rise up I'm gonna rise up, rise up, rise up Rise up people against the war 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 Rise up Hello, this is uh, Dan Shea with the Veterans for Peace Forum. Uh, we do this every fourth Saturday of the month and we're on uh, Metro East uh, Community Media. Uh, program being broadcast on uh, Comcast Cable, Channel 11. Uh, and I want to thank my producers, uh, uh, Kelly Labonte and uh, Jim Lockhart, for continuing to do this program and bring veterans' issues to our local community. We do put this up on YouTube, and it reaches uh, people who have seen it from all over the world. Um, so we want to keep this uh, program, and I want people to re realize that we need to always have these sort of alternative programs available so that our voices are heard. Uh, you know, our newspapers and our media, uh, mainstream media, doesn't address a number of the issues that uh, a lot of us veterans really have some concern for. Uh, today's program, we're going to have um, Iraq veteran Ray Harris. Uh, Authority and Expectations is sort of the topic of the program. Uh, but we're kind of, we'll kind of talk about a lot of different things. Ray is an Iraq vet, uh, war veteran, combat veteran, uh, who fought in uh, Ghazalia? Ghazalia. Ghazalia, Baghdad from uh, November 2006 to December 2007. After being discharged for post-traumatic stress, uh, he came back uh, to find a world that wasn't as inviting as it was when he left. Um, and after working in a popular socialist uh, justice organization, Ray's frustration, frustrations uh, led him to become involved in a collective of veterans called Veterans Transition Corps. That is working to heal veterans and communities in holistic uh, fashion through permaculture skills that con contributes to the eco-regional and bio-regional re resiliency. Um, they are looking at many approaches uh, for helping veterans to help themselves and creating their own communities in transition from the military to post 
military life. Ray was also involved with the uh, Michael Mead of Mosaic Voices uh, with the Veterans Retreat. Uh, we share that in common because uh, I had gone through uh, a similar program called the Welcome Home Project. In fact, uh, uh, the Welcome is going to be is going to be screened here um, at the uh, Cedar Mills uh, Community Library. Uh, that's going to be coming up this uh, Wednesday at uh, I think at 7 p.m. and I'll be uh, talking uh, about the program after after the movie screened. So if you're out in uh, Cedar Mill Community Library, it's one two five zero five Northwest Cornell Road. You can look it up online. That's how I found the address. Uh, you have an opportunity to see that program and and what veterans went through. Uh, we've talked about the program before, so I'm not going to talk about it here. I think people really need to see it because it's about community coming together and wel welcoming veterans back. Um, now there's uh, a couple of other things I wanted to to just bring up. There's so many events that are happening in our lives as we turn around. I want to remind people that Bradley Manning is still uh, uh, in <clears throat> in prison and uh, military prison uh, and coming up for a trial uh, again. And uh, so there's uh, we're asking people to get go online and uh, keep supporting Bradley Manning. Uh, September uh, 30th at 5 to 7.30 p.m., the Georgetown University Law Center is going to be uh, uh, talking about uh, truth of the trial. I think we need to, everybody needs to hear it. Here's somebody who is in, you know, I mean, he's connected to the WikiLeaks uh, um, uh, um, whistleblowing and, and getting out information that uh, should be transparent in our military. But I think the real thing that hit him was the, the film Collateral uh, Damage and uh, this uh, helicopter that was uh, hoovering over a number of people and we could hear and listen to what was happening as they fired on innocent people. A uh, few children were in this van that was uh, hit. And when you hear the, the process, in fact, they actually go through the process of asking for permission to, to hit. These are the sort of... Uh, conducts of war and that they're supposed to follow, but it's one in which they were so anxious to, to push it, please, you know, almost like, come on, come on, give me the okay. And uh, and the people that are making the okay are listening to the people in the copter saying, yeah, well, they, well, they have weapons, they have weapons. And, and that turns out uh, there were a number of them were camera uh, camera people that were reporters on the scene and innocent people there. And when you talk about weapons there, people carry weapons just to be able to survive. So uh, it's a horrible vet video and it uh, was a disgrace for our, our military and for our country and I think that was one of the things that hit. But the WikiLeaks information also then uh, extended to uh, uh, embassy memos and uh, things that were happening not just in this country but in Latin America, Asia, and other places. That's why they go so hard after uh, 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 Adrian Assange also. But I just wanted you to have that information and uh, also uh, one of my colleagues out there is uh, Penny Dex just had a birthday. Is having her birthday today? Uh, tomorrow, actually. Tomorrow. Happy tomorrow. birthday, So 30, we had a sh shout out to her. Penny's been doing a lot of work with Ray and other veterans in this uh, veterans transition uh, group. And uh, and I just wanted to, to acknowledge that. Also, Leah Bolger, uh, the president of uh, uh, Veterans for Peace on the national level. Leah has a birthday wish, you know. You can go online, just go to Veterans for Peace, um, our website, our national website, and you have to spell it out, www.veteransforpeace.org, and you'll see her wish there. Uh, but she's just, she likes to say, I'm so proud uh, of the work being done by my brothers and sisters in Veterans for Peace who are using their voices every day to educate the public about the true costs and consequences of war. We know that veterans... <clears throat> As veterans, we have uh, a responsibility to tell our stories and relate our experiences about the ugly truth of war and militarism, uh, and to work towards uh, their end. So I want to. She wanted to thank people. Uh, basically, she's just saying, you know, donate. <laughs> uh, uh, find a way to get involved. And if you're a veteran, you know, um, 
uh, join Veterans for Peace or join another, if, it's, uh, if you're uh, not comfortable with us, join another veterans organization. It's the beginning of a process that people uh, get active. And I think it's also a way of, of understanding what happened to you and it's also a way of uh, a path to healing in some, some form. Another event that's coming up uh, is Colonel Ann Wright. I've uh, been helping organize this. Uh, Colonel Ann Wright in breaking the Israeli naval blockade by sailing with Gaza exports. Now she was involved before in the past on the uh, flotillas to Gaza when the Israelis attacked. Um, she's been a constant uh, uh, advocate. We say Colonel Ann Wright because she uh, was a naval officer who had uh, spent some uh, almost nearly 30 years in the service of her country, mm -hmm. uh, retired in the, uh, uh, in the reserves, uh, became a diplomat in uh, the Middle East, Latin America, and a number of different places. She's gonna bring her story and her, her analysis of what's going on in the world uh, to uh, this uh, Friday, October 12th, uh, when that comes up, it'll be 7.30 p.m. Uh, at the First Unitarian Church of Portland, Elliott Chapel, uh, 1011 Southwest 12th. Uh, this is uh, uh, going to be an international effort. It's a fundraiser, so we hope you come out for that. More information, just contact me through Veterans for Peace. They'll put that up uh, later time. Uh, that's Dan Shea, uh, DJ Shea at Hotmail.com. And, uh, and I'll pass on more information as it comes along. But you can always go to Veterans for Peace, um, uh, Chapter 72's website, and we try to keep people informed on the various events that are coming up. There's, uh, there's another thing, uh, you know, when we talk about media uh, uh, here in Portland, we have a number of different medias. We have the Portland Alliance, which uh, uh, deals with community activist news and what's going on in, in our community. We have Occupy. Uh, there are a number of things that are going on with Occupy. Uh, it's, uh, you can go on uh, Facebook to uh, find out Occupy Portland. Uh, the various things, there's Occupy Labor. In fact, uh, KBU Radio, uh, another great community program, um, they have a Labor Radio uh, on Monday, September 24th from um, 6 to 6.30, they're going to be talking about the Chicago teacher strike. And as you know, they just settled that. And uh, this was the one in which uh, teachers, uh, like all unions, all workers, have been um, uh, up against the wall in these sort of austerity measures that are being uh, uh, played out throughout the world from our sort of corporate uh, masters. <laughs> and uh, it's been anti-union for a long time. Um, like the Teamsters Union, which has a group called TDU, which is Teachers for a Democratic uh, Union, there's a rank and file movement that's starting to say, you know, the leadership is falling behind in really meeting their demands. Well, they created a, uh, uh, I forget what they called themselves, but there's a, in this new Teachers Union, uh, they've organized under a sort of rank and file, and that rank and file is the one that, uh, began their strike and they're the ones that began to speak out. You can follow that also on uh, on Amy Goodman's show Democracy Now. She's got a she's had interviews with them. Uh, but check into KBU Radio and uh, listen to that on uh, 6:30 to 6:30 I mean 6 o'clock to 6:30 p.m. Uh, this Monday uh, Labor Radio. There's also an action that's happening tomorrow. And I think this is uh, an important one, if you can get involved, please do. It's part of the mission of Veterans for Peace. Uh, nuclear, <clears throat> it's a nuclear-free uh, Portland kickoff. It's going to be from 1 o'clock to 4 p.m. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Sunday, that's uh, September 23rd, on the waterfront. Uh, you know, uh, just north of Burnside at the uh, Hiroshima, uh, Hiroshima uh, Memorial. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a, there's a number of different events. We just had one during uh, August uh, 5th and 6th and, uh, for <clears throat> the days of uh, the bombing. But uh, this movement is growing and growing as, we, as, as time goes on. So I want people just to know about those things. Those are a couple of things I wanted to get out of the way. Uh, another thing, before we really get into the discussion here with Ray, there, there was a young man here from... Um, 
Washington, D.C. He's also on the board. Uh, his name is uh, Matt Southworth. We had an event here uh, Sunday, September 9th um, at the Friends Meeting Hall. We had a number of sponsors there, uh, uh, the Friends there, the uh, Young Friends. Uh, we had uh, um, uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility, Women's International League of Peace um, and Freedom, uh, Portland uh, First Unitarian Church, all of those plus Veterans for Peace, of course. We, we brought Matt here to talk about sort of legislative uh, uh, agenda. Matt is uh, also uh, somebody who works for, uh, he's a staff on the Legislation Association of Foreign Policy for the uh, Friends Committee on National Legislation. Uh, he has a lot of experience. Uh, he's an Iraq vet. Um, he tells a little bit about his, his experience. And I have a video here, and we want to go ahead and roll that in, and we'll get a little bit of feel for what he said there, since not all of you were there, but it was really well attended, and uh, I think it's just we got to burn the candle kind of at both ends. So if you can go ahead and roll in the first video, we just have a few little clips here, about three of them, I think. A little bit about uh, my own background and how I came to this work, and then I'd like to get into the details of why I'm here. Really talk to you all about uh, what's happening in Washington, and why you all are so very important in actually affecting what happens in Washington uh, over the next year and for the foreseeable future, honestly. So FCNL, uh, how many folks in here are familiar with FCNL? All right, it's so almost, almost the whole room. So I'll just be very brief. You know, we've been around for around 67 years, uh, a very long uh, standing organization. We are a Quaker lobby in the public interest on Capitol Hill. And we were founded after World War II, really out of the need and the, and the desire to have uh, Friends Voice on Capitol Hill, uh, the witness of Friends on Capitol Hill. Uh, I, uh, the folks who founded FCNL believed that there was a real gap in um, the, what was happening policy-wise and, and the consciousness of Friends. So that was really the impetus for starting uh, the Friends Committee on National Legislation. We have grown into an organization that is governed by hundreds of Quaker meetings uh, around the country. Every two years in a new Congress, we solicit our priorities from these meetings, these yearly and monthly meetings around the country. They submit uh, to us what they think we should work on. We put those together, and then we uh, take that document and put it to our general committee, which is uh, a, a body that is uh, essentially representative of these Quaker meetings. And they vote whether or not, or they, you know, by consensus, I should say, uh, <laughs> whether or not to, to adopt this document. And that really, that is our guiding document for the next two years for the new Congress. So we're in this process now. This November, our priorities will change a little. And they're not dramatic shifts always. Uh, sometimes things fall off of our priorities list. Sometimes things get added on. Uh, there's been a big push uh, in the last few years to include... Um, campaign finance reform and money and politics and our priorities. So now we're looking at how we can do that and ways to do that. So just to give you an example, I'm very, I feel very privileged to work for FCNL. Number one, because we're a, a well-functioning nonprofit, which is fairly rare. Uh, for anyone who's been associated with nonprofits or worked for nonprofits, uh, there's plenty of dysfunction out there. But, but also, uh, I feel very fortunate because we are really a democratic organization. We, we essentially are governed and um, we get our priorities from the people around the country who really want us to focus on these things that are very near, dear, and passionate, uh, they're, that they're passionate about. So um, really can't say enough about that. We're one of the only non-Native uh, groups working on Native American rights. We uh, have a nuclear disarmament program. We work on reducing Pentagon spending. Uh, we work on a variety of other issues, including foreign policy, preventing war with Iran, uh, coming up with a peaceful solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, ending the war in Iraq, uh, and now ending the war in Afghanistan. And that's actually my area of expertise. Uh, well, specialize. I'm, I don't think there is such a thing as an Afghanistan expert. That's one of the things I've learned in the last couple of years. Uh, as much as you think you understand, there's always more to know. Uh, but it's a, it's a very dynamic organization uh, in that we have this breadth and depth of issues. We have about 40 staff. We're the largest peace lobby on Capitol Hill. So as we're waiting for the next queue up here, let's just give you a little brief thing. I'm just taking that with uh, one of my, just my uh, regular 
digital camera, and I'm really surprised at how well it came out. So I'm, I'm glad that we're able to show some of these things. Um, also, you know, I'm not one to really uh, get so involved in the uh, uh, the political, uh, I should say, electoral sort of process, the legislative process. But sometimes, you know, we have to burn the candle at both ends and somewhere meet in the middle. And uh, so this is one one way to, to begin that. And Matt has that experience. I, I've i been in the streets more than I have been in, in the, the offices of our representatives. But it is good for that. We need, if we're going to raise our voices, we do need to let them know how we feel. And uh, where we have an opportunity, uh, we should take that opportunity to, to be specific uh, about uh, uh, military cuts to, uh, to the budget, to the, uh, the Department of Defense and these uh, war profiteers, because a lot of money can come back to our own communities. So if you're ready with the next one, we'll just go ahead into that, get a little bit more of a feel for this. Um, all I can really describe it as is that I felt like a stranger, uh, even among my family. Mm -hmm. I felt like I came back to this world, uh, to the US, and people had no idea. They just, no one had any clue. And you watch the news, and it doesn't even come close to representing what's happening on the ground. It doesn't even come close to capturing the terror on the people's faces that were occupying. You know, these people who had nothing to do with 9-11, Iraqis who had nothing to do with the weapons of mass destruction or anything like that. And uh, I just was really out of touch, and I kind of became a recluse. I started, I, you know, I've always been very socially outgoing and, uh, you know, always hanging out, always had friends. And I became really withdrawn, and I would only go to work. I got a job at Lowe's where I improved home improvement. And uh, I would go to work and I would come home and I would just like sit in my room. I'd watch TV, read, whatever. And my parents didn't really understand what was happening either. You know, um, it's a funny thing when you go to war and you can communicate by email and stuff like that. Uh, but you essentially, I always try to keep my parents out of the loop, as much out of the loop as possible. You know, they're already worrying about you and you don't want them to know that, you know, what's happening around you and, and all that. So my parents had this perception that I went and sat around and ate ice cream for six months. And um, so when I came back, and I didn't really know how to process with my, you know, my experience, I had no one to talk to. I, I went through the VA system, and they kind of just shoveled me right along uh, at that point in time. And I became very isolated. And uh, this really culminated one night when I came home from work, and I had to cross through the living room to get to my, uh, my room. And my dad said, uh, now, just to give you an understanding, my dad is one of those really tough dads. And the kind of dad that could beat everyone's dad up kind of thing. Um, he, he could beat up everybody else's dad. You know, okay. My dad. Very, very tough. Uh, and, you know, I, even after war, I came back with the fear of God and dad in me. You know? <laughs> so dad says, you know, get over here, boy. And I walk over and he said, you know, you better knock that chip off your shoulder before I knock it off for you. And uh, it was at that time I realized that my, my family and my folks, they just didn't understand uh, what I was kind of struggling with. And um, I went in my room and you know, I said, the only thing I could muster was, you know, I don't have a chip on my shoulder. And I said it through tears, um, which I'm not a crier. I mean, look at me, I'm pretty tough. I'm not a crier, it's not what we do. Uh, but I you know, go in my room, my mom follows me and she just sits next to me and says, uh, Matt, tell us what's wrong. You know, we, we know something's going on, talk to us. You know, what happened, what, what, you know, what's going on with you? Is it your girlfriend, is it this, you know, is it that? And I just, I couldn't bring myself to have this conversation with my mother. The things that I talked to you about, I, I couldn't, I still have not talked to my own family about because it's just too hard. The words don't come. Um, and I think it really comes down to uh, the simple fact that you can't tell your mother what you've done in war and still be the same person. You just can't. Uh, so I've continued to kind of keep... Yeah, I think that's an experience that uh, all of us have had that have been in combat. Uh, this is, uh, I'm glad that Matt was able to share uh, what it was like to be a veteran uh, in combat and how difficult it is when you come back. And, you know, it took a long time for him to turn it around and, and start to get involved in, in a number of different ways. He was also with uh, IVAW. He was, uh, now he's on the board of Veterans for Peace. And uh, this uh, job with the uh, Friends Legislative Committee, he's doing really good work for all of us. Um, He's, he's, he knows what it was like and why we need to stop these wars. I mean, one of the main things that <clears throat> Veterans for Peace 
uh, mission is, is, you know, to increase public awareness of the cost of war, to restrain our government for, from intervening overtly and covertly in the internal affairs of other nations, to end the arms race and reduce and eventually eliminate nuclear weapons. That's like tomorrow you got a chance on working on that. To seek justice for veterans and victims of war, and those are the veterans coming back that, you know, they keep cutting uh, funds for people. Uh, there's vouchers that are out there from HUD and others for veterans that aren't being used and being wasted, and the bureaucracy is keeping them away. And our major purpose is to abolish war as an instrument of national policy. And we'll just go into the next clip, and, um, and then we'll get back into the interview with Ray here. Now, this is a little misleading, right? Because we are nearing a cliff, but we knew it was there because we quarried the rock. Yeah. We what? We, we quarried the rock. We, we dug the rock out ourselves. We have had, uh, in the last 10 years, enormous tax cuts. We have had two major wars that have so far resulted in around $3 trillion added to the deficit. In the long term, will result in four to six trillion dollars added to what is now, pardon me, a 16 trillion dollar deficit. It is a tremendous amount of money uh, that is coming and being added to the deficit through these sorts of things and other things as well. And uh, it, it, it amazes me that over the last 12 years, Congress, and not just Republicans, not just Democrats, but Congress, has set us up for this. They've, they've added this money to the deficit and then they've taken us to the point where they say, now we need to make tough choices. That's amazing. If you really stop and think about it, we do have tough choices to make. We do. Uh, and I think chief among them is that the United States cannot afford to spend $600 billion a year on the Pentagon's base budget, not including the wars. Well, that's true, and that's what, the, you know, uh, and it's not just this country. When we're talking about the economy uh, over a cliff, uh, we're talking about what's happening in uh, Europe, um, and everybody's being affected by it. It's not just war, but it's a real policy of um, uh, constraint against people that have been working all their lives to to just try to, to survive, and uh, the middle class is disappearing. But, you know, it's, it's from a veteran's perspective, we, you know, oftentimes they're sending us to war so that we can secure uh, land, uh, oil, uh, resources of other people's country, and to uh, basically uh, uh, make them sort of our, our workers uh, as slaves almost. And when you put, put it that way, they, they got to do our bidding. Uh, we're going to shove democracy down their throats, even if it takes it at the point of the gun, you know. And so, Ray, I mean, you were there in Iraq. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in small town Oregon and bounced all over the Northwest for a while and found myself in the Army out of high school. Now, when, when I first met you, I mean, it's been a couple of years now since we first met you. I think it's been about two years yeah. since I was in this room last, yeah. yeah. And uh, you and I, you know, we, we've been through the Occupy mm -hmm. <laughs> movement and you're doing a lot of great stuff. But yeah, I remember you telling me that you know uh, you came from a fairly conservative family. And, yeah. And uh, tell us what led you to go into the service in the first place. Angst, anger, you know. Um, that hasn't stopped. No, it. not at all. Not at all. <laughs> uh, kind of being kicked around, you know, a little bit as a kid, and then finding an avenue and a moral sense of validation through the whole nationalist patriotist aspect, or patriotic aspect of things. Uh, a reason to go and, and, you know, cultivate myself in that fashion and, and express those frustrations. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so you, you uh, joined when? I joined in this October 2005. And you ended up in, in uh, Baghdad in November of 2006? Mm-hmm. Okay. Can you tell us anything about your experience there and what, uh, what happened? Because it says, I mean, it says you were discharged for post-traumatic stress. Yeah, you know, it was a combat tour, you know, 13 mm -hmm. months and 26 days, but who's counting? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, I came away with all my fingers and toes and I have all my digits, but I definitely have some hurt feelings. Yeah. And just trying to live life through that. <laughs> but you were, you know, were you 
what was your, uh, it was an army? I was in the army. army. I was an 11 Bravo. Okay. Infantryman. Infantryman. So you were on the front lines. Mm-hmm. And uh, did you have much experience, I mean, uh, uh, relationships with the Iraqi people themselves? Interacting on a daily basis mm -hmm. in various capacities. And what did you see? I mean, what, did you, what changed your feelings? And Was it the experience itself? It was a slow yet sudden process, a mm -hmm. combination of several events and, of course, taking the time to eventually process and put them into a perspective that made a little bit more sense than what the Army may have told me was the, the, the right way to feel about things. Um, but it, wasn't, I mean, it was just a, a whole learning experience, it really was. And there are specific events and there's you know, isolated in incidents and just things that you see the other side and you see what was not on on the recruiting video and you see what the end result of a war really is. Mm -hmm. Now when I was in uh, Vietnam, I mean, it's almost like the minute I got there, people seemed, I, I, at least I ended up with some people that seemed conscious about uh, the war was not about uh, the flag and ma and apple pie. Mm -hmm. That <clears throat> when we got there, they said just, you know, t you know, throw that out the door. What you're here to do now is survive. And uh, they put us in situations where you, you know, if somebody shoots at you, you shoot back. And uh, uh, But we were also in situations where they had these sort of, uh, what they called search and destroy missions. Mm -hmm. And the search and destroy mission meant that anybody there was free game. And there were some people with eager trigger fingers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it didn't matter if it was an old woman going through a field or whatever. <clears throat> uh, they wanted to. I just happened to be with a, a, a lieutenant in our platoon who uh, stopped people from doing it uh, at that time. But this was after Tet, so um, Tet had already happened. Yeah. Uh, and so these, you know, I don't know if that had an experience on, upon him to to restrain people who seemed eager. And there used to be kind of like two groups of people. There were those that were really gung ho and. Uh, the racist language that they had mm -hmm. against the people. I mean, the people, we were taught that they were evil people and that we were there to, you know, help uh, help them. I, yeah. You know, we're going we're gonna to help the evil people, but they're all evil and they, they all need to be destroyed. Freedom tip <clears throat> Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, the confusion there. But yeah. we also, you know, I mean, um, uh, there was resistance to a lot of the... Uh, sort of uh, language among uh, there were the other group of people were those that were already sort of aware of things that were mm -hmm. going on. We had the draft, yeah. So there were people that didn't want to be there. Mm -hmm. There were people that didn't uh, have any respect or love for the officers. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, some that had been in in combat longer than the officers that had been there to t tell them what to do, and uh, so you know you hear stories about people who were that fragged officers at that mm -hmm. time. Uh, we didn't have any of that kind of stuff, but the we did have uh, a mutiny. I had a mutiny mm -hmm. in the field when I was there, and I was a part of that. And, and it's you know I didn't even know we were really doing anything. We were just sick and tired of it, you know that kind of thing. And uh, it's been I'm reflecting on it many years later and seeing things that happened. And then I, there were a number of people that were killed, like in. Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, it's, it wasn't necessarily um, uh, a firefight. Mm -hmm. It was a sniper, mm -hmm. or it was uh, um, uh, a booby trap, or a mine. And a, yeah, that's what booby trap. A lot of more mines. They mm -hmm. were, you know, uh, well, they had. Of course, we had punji pits in the mm -hmm. jungle. But you guys have uh, improvised uh, explosives. Oh, just, they got bombs all over the road. Yeah. Well, they did. The war's over now. <clears throat> um, so we're told something yeah. about armed contractors remaining in place to secure the <laughs> the remaining assets, or, or I'm not sure what the reason is, but uh, I, I think that the draft definitely had a big difference on the psychological impact and state of mind that people had when they were in the military, when they were forced from the get-go, and to have these pr obligations, especially under the weight of you know prosecution, criminal and lawful uh, prosecution. But now that it's an all-volunteer force, I think that just by nature of that, a lot of the would-be resistful mentality, it's not, it's not really there mm -hmm. in a large scale. Right. Um, you know, in the 60s, it was definitely, and the 70s, definitely a really large GI resistance. 
and you don't really see that too much anymore on the scale that, that did exist. And uh, fundamentally, it's, it's not so much that I don't think the nature of war has changed, it's just that the people that we've selected to do the fighting has uh, changed significantly. But there had been a lot of resistance even there. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people in the field, uh, that uh, Kevin Benderman, uh, who refused to uh, uh, participate anymore and was tried and almost spent, I think, uh, a little over a year in, at uh, Fort Lewis. And, mm -hmm. and uh, Camila Mejia, the same thing. You mm -hmm. know? Uh, and we, we hear uh, there's a number of veterans that are up in uh, Canada. There was a woman that was just uh, deported from Canada. Mm -hmm. Uh, what do you remember her name? I forget it. Uh, it escapes my mind. Yeah, at right the now, Kim something. Kim, I think uh, Kimberly or something. Anyhow, that, that uh, if people want to know about that, uh, please uh, go to Courage to Resist. Uh, Courage to Resist will keep you up on uh, GI resistors um, uh, uh, from the war, and uh, they keep people abreast mm -hmm. of what's going on. And great supporters of Bradley Manning. Bradley Manning, an excellent, excellent example of contemporary real resistance, and I think capital R resistance, yeah. uh, and that he's allegedly supposed to have done the, to have released this information um, for the purpose of bringing awareness. That's right. Which, I, you know, I think is unique. I think it's unique, and that's why the consequences he's paying are much more unique than the consequences of others who resist. Well, it seems, too, that, I mean, it's, it's not unusual. I mean, you have Daniel Ellsberg in uh, the White Papers of Vietnam mm -hmm. who actually is standing with Bradley Manning and mm -hmm. saying, you know, he's done no di nothing any different than uh, that he had done, and uh, that there's a, a certain point in which war is, uh, uh, when people, when the veterans and uh, those that are involved in analysis of the war recognize that these wars are based on lies, that it's the duty of uh, every citizen, every soldier to expose those lies. I mean, our real uh, loyalty isn't to um, the president or the uh, um, uh, our officers, but to the Constitution. And uh, and you know, I think truth prevails. But here is a real attempt, and we have laws that are supposed to protect um, whistleblowers, mm -hmm. and yet those are being ignored, even under uh, so-called progressive uh, President Obama. Uh, we've had more people going uh, after whistleblowers than almost any other administration, so well, very scary. Laws are a funny thing. We were yeah. talking the other night, yes, and I, 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 uh, I pointed <clears throat> out that, because I, you know, I think <laughs> in my own mind's eye and experiences, laws are really mechanisms that protect and enable oppression, that's all right. oppression. It's not really, so to legislate, that's what, because there's laws to protect whistleblowers, you know, there's, right. there's laws to protect all sorts of things, but it doesn't really seem to play out that way. You know, people and whistleblowers and, and, and veterans who resist, even legally, aren't often protected, even <clears throat> perhaps criminally, but culturally, there's not a lot of protection. Right. Well, and, and, you know, I mean, I told you that I'd been on uh, Facebook uh, sort of arguing that point. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there was a, there was a interview by uh, uh, John Cusack, uh, the, the uh, movie star, who's mm -hmm. interviewing this prof law professor about uh, the various lies about war, and they keep talking about rules of law and how the government has broke these rules of law. And as though that somehow if it was, you know, if they had followed the law, we wouldn't have ended up there. Yet, it seems to me that uh, there would have been an argument, uh, well, what if this was a legal war? You know, if this was a legal war, then uh, uh, would we not uh, have any reason to uh, oppose it? Uh, you know, they had laws that, that protected uh, slave owners. They had uh, women uh, couldn't vote. Uh, they were treated as chattel. And uh, there have been a lot of laws that have been written for, I think, the few to control mm -hmm. the majority, as, you, as you're saying. And so it's not, you know, I think somehow we got to get away from the mumbo-jumbo that law in itself, this rule of law, is the only thing. But mm -hmm. th there's something higher than that. And it doesn't need to be spiritual or religious or anything, mm -hmm. but it, it's, it's sort of a moral compass that we carry with inside us. We grew up you know, with our brothers and sisters and uh, our, our parents telling us, you know, we have to respect the other person. We have to love and care for yeah. our neighbors. And it, we and we as veterans talk about community, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, of anything else, we have a strong bond. 
as veterans to make sure that uh, our brothers and sisters uh, um, are going to be taken care of. And, mm -hmm. and we're fighting uh, various, uh, I guess, uh, for us, not particularly a law, but more or less, I would say, uh, uh, bureaucracies. And sometimes the law can be a bureaucracy. And uh, these things, you know, hold people back, uh, make it difficult for people to seek the kind of help they need. Well, and in a lot of ways, the help that, you know, veterans are supposed to come back and get, it's it, like the VA, it's often argued VA needs more people. The Department of Veterans Affairs, mm -hmm. they need more people, they need more psychologists, they need more money, um, they need more research. But, you know, if you look at the numbers, even if, even if they had all those things, <clears throat> And every veteran who's eligible to make a claim and get treatment through VA actually did. It's 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 not plausible. It's absolutely not plausible mm -hmm. to mitigate and take care of veterans or to reintegrate them in the capacity that it, most society would want to think that you can. I don't think. Um, and what society are you going to integrate them into? Is another question. Well, it, as it se it seems like the one that they're supposed to reintegrate to, into is one that rejects them <laughs> and one that they don't necessarily like in return. All right, for me too, I mean, it, it's, it's coming into a system that is broken. Mm -hmm. uh, a system that, uh, I mean, we're talking, well, oftentimes our, our system is both politically and economically linked. Mm -hmm. And the economy, um, why did we go to war? Oftentimes to secure that economy for uh, the vast majority in in the earlier days when people thought you know that we in the 50s it was great uh, <clears throat> my dad got to live the American dream I mean he was born in Panama his you know this uh, they were poor growing up and uh, and he you know he he did well for himself over uh, over a period but he raised six kids in a two-bedroom house when we were young just as a bartender you know mm -hmm. until he got his own bar uh, I saw him live the dream as it was disappearing before my eyes, you know, as I was growing up. Uh, but the, that, when I started looking at history, and since, you know, he was born in Panama, I have a strong connection to Latin American history. So looking at Latin American history, I saw this, this rape of the land and the people uh, in there that actually supplied us with the wealth that we had in mm -hmm. this country. It wasn't that uh, the American dream was based on just the initiative of Americans. It was based upon a real military power that held uh, sway over these uh, uh, indigenous peoples as we wiped out uh, uh, the Native Americans of this country and still have forced them off into uh, reservations and uh, racism mm -hmm. and prejudices uh, that still harm that that community. So it's like killing people and taking their stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Very yeah. simple, right? Yeah. Very simple. You know, and keeping them down. And if they want their stuff back or if they point out the fact that, you know, what, this, what is, why is this even happening? You know, you get, uh, you get shamed. <laughs> but you're, but you're, you're coming back and, and the system that, that, uh, you're coming back into is the very one that sent you to war. Mm -hmm. It's the very one that, that uh, uh, enslaves you again because I mean you got to eat, you got to put a roof over your head, you mm -hmm. have to, you go to work for one organization or another, and if you're lucky, you might be able to work for a nonprofit, but not everything's a nonprofit. Not no. everybody's involved in in doing good. I mean they they're just trying to survive, and uh, you guys have formed a, a sort of a collective, and and it's it's taking a different look at returning. And you want to talk a little bit about that. So me and uh, some friends have been working on a project for some time. Um, the goal being to provide a holistic reintegration avenue approach for returning veterans um, through the concept of permaculture, the mm -hmm. healing, gardening, food, uh, food uh, growing practices that are sustainable, although the term is sometimes abused. Um, and because there's a, there's a lot of healing to be found in connecting with the land because the land is very powerful, and it, it's been proven through uh, farmer veteran project or correction farmer veteran coalition has has had a lot of success in linking veterans up with farms, uh, the veterans farm in Florida, but there's another one called Archie's Acres, mm -hmm. um, and this is a trend that's catching on veterans and the farming uh, lifestyle it's kind of a natural transgression I think or transmit 
transition, I think. Yeah. Transgression. <laughs> transitioning. Transitioning. Yeah. Um, and, and, and simultaneously, with providing veterans a healing atmosphere and, and a, a safe space for self-actualization which and identity recovery, which is one thing that I think is an issue that's not so much discussed and talked about. Um, we have a lot of problems with big agriculture poisoning our food. <laughs> right. And we have a lot of farms, small farms, that because of a genera generational issue uh, are either looking to sell their stuff somehow Mm -hmm. um, because a lot changed and kids don't really work on the farm anymore. You know, they go off to college and then they go do other things. And we have a whole bunch of uh, very gifted and talented people in the veteran demographic that are very passionate and capable of tending these farms and growing this food and feeling that sense of, of uh, validation and, and completeness and community. <clears throat> you guys just did a, a little project here uh, mm -hmm. in Oregon City. Mm -hmm. You want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, what? What was that? It, you, it, you say permaculture. Explain permaculture. In the best way that I think I can put it at this point, permaculture is basically the way that nature wants to grow food and it wants to work within itself. Um, so monoculture and the idea of plowing and tilling a tremendous plot of land and planting it with the same thing, uh, genetically modified or otherwise, um, not doing that and not using pesticides and not using... Uh, uh, destructive practices that kill the soil, kill the mycorrhizae, and uh, deplete nutrition in the soil. And use uh, you know, use uh, um, the sort of crops that grow within the, a certain bioregion. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, a lot of um, um, our food is shipped from all over the world, and you know, we grow apples, and we we have great farmland here, but often. If you're in the farming business, mm -hmm. uh, it's being exported, and uh, we start thinking about exportation and importation. And then we start thinking about, you know, what is the cost of doing that? What is the cost to society? I mean, you got to ship this stuff. Uh, your oil that you're using again, another reason we have to control the Middle East. Uh, yeah, we need to ship these things from one place. Um, um, we have to freeze the food. We have to keep it cold. A lot of energy is being used when, when really just uh, uh, a few miles away, there's a farm that you could uh, get the, your food from, and uh, it's fresh. Mm -hmm. it's, it's for that bioregion. It's probably better for your health. Oh, yeah. All of these things. And, uh, and you build a community with people. I remember when I was growing up, uh, we had... We used to have uh, people, you know, come down the street with a watermelon truck. <laughs> we'd, they'd roll it off. It was like... I, I, pennies, actually, uh -huh. you know, for these things, and we'd break it open, and uh, we'd have the, the watermelon. I could walk to school in the morning and glean food from uh, the neighbor's gardens mm -hmm. as I went. And there was a plum tree, an apple tree, and somebody growing rhubarb along the side, and there was always plenty. It just seemed like I never had to really take one at <laughs> lunch, you know, <laughs> I would have that. And, uh, I mean, now I go into the store and everything's packaged and sealed and uh, even, the, even the apples I taste anymore, they, they're, they're soggy and just ne nothing tastes the same anymore. And it doesn't feel the same when you eat it. You know, if yeah. you, like when you eat a fresh farm salad that had, uh, you know, happy food and happy nutrients and clean water. And if you eat a diet consisting of fresh food for a week, fresh raw food, uh, you will notice an absolute difference. And I'd hate to go off on a health tangent, you know yeah. what I mean? It's better, but, you know, uh, nutrition is a fundamental way of helping veterans ail numerous woes as well. And helping your community. And helping your community because you can grow this food and you can give it back to people that need it. And there's that symbiotic relationship. So there's, there's a lot of people that are growing up in this world that never learned uh, to work on a farm, mm -hmm. uh, don't even know where to begin. And so... You're getting some of those kind of people, and you're training them, and and you're doing our best, yeah. yeah, yeah, and putting together courses. We had uh, Steve Cran of Green Warriors come out uh, from Australia, and he's a permaculture instructor, and him, and uh, Destone Deniston of, of Abundance Permaculture LLC out of uh, Washington State up north. They uh, taught us an excellent course, and we had a lot of vets out there, some for the day, some for a few days, um, some consistently for the whole two weeks. It was free, and it was all funded by donations from the community and the Oregon Food Bank. Um, 
it, it was it was a very very powerful experience. Yeah, you have a lot of kudos to Penny too. Penny Dex has really helped uh, sort of organize uh, people around these ideas and stuff. Penny Dex is a fireball, isn't she? <laughs> I love her. I think she's just doing great work. Um, the um, when we're when we're talking about these building communities, I mean, one of the things is you guys are doing something immediate uh, to help people. You talk about getting back to the earth. Uh, I remember there was a there was a veteran. Uh, his name is Charlie Clements, who uh, uh, was in Vietnam and uh, refused uh, his his commission as a pilot when they were bombing with napalm and everything mm -hmm. else. And later became a doctor and went to El Salvador. And I remember in his book when I was reading it, uh, he talked about an indigenous man who would go with just a stick and hit it in the ground and just plant one seed. And he says, well, why are you doing that? You can, can't you just spread a bunch of seed here? And he, the, he said, the earth, uh, each time I do this, we wound in the earth, I have to take care and plant this seed so it'll grow. And I mean, just that idea that you're investing yourself mm -hmm. and the earth is investing back, there's a sort of respect that kind of helps build something, of, I don't know, between man and nature. Well, isol you know, and spending time isolated from civilization, mm -hmm. from the dominant culture, uh, enclaves of big cities and, yeah. and urbanization, and putting yourself on a, on a mountain trail, you know, and spending the day and breathing the air and listening to the sounds of the natural world, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's irreplaceable. And I spent time, I grew up in, you know, all over the Northwest, all over the Cascadian bioregion. Uh, Idaho, in particular, it was very easy to find an isolated place. And uh, I often did. I was a young boy and I'd go out and I'd, you know, see the deer and talk to the deer, and, you know. Uh, Not to a chair. Though. No, 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 of course, <laughs> never to an empty chair. <laughs> I just could. Yeah. I could resist that. <laughs> uh, but uh, now, you know, there's a, I mean, you've been, you're a great speaker and you've gone into some of the schools and talked to people, kids and uh, uh, you've spoken at a number of rallies. Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a little documentary that uh, you just recently released. Uh, I did an interview a few hmm. months back and uh, turned into a, lengthier film. It's, uh, I just got the final copy today and we're going to be screening it around. So if anybody wants to come and hear my... Uh, Rant? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <No. laughs> yeah, it's a little bit yeah. of everything. I think, and again, it's not unlike, um, you know, the, the feelings that veterans expressed when, when they spoke after the retreats with uh, Michael Mead. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, a lot of times, you know, veterans, we have a language it may be offensive to some people, but it expresses the way we speak and think. And if we're telling our truth, we can't pretend or, or make that soft. No. And, and so just to let people know, I mean, foul language is a part of the, you know, the culture of veterans. And, mm -hmm. uh, and at times, it's the only words that really express the pain and, yeah. and the anger and the frustration. But it's worth, worth that for people to to kind of put that aside and listen to be what's being said. Sometimes you need the vehemence and the, and the visceral nature of, of, of a dialogue to feel impacted where it's coming from. And I mean, I don't think people would be surprised to know that this isn't how we conventionally talk. Right. You know, it's yeah. not yeah. very formal and you know, it's, it's very animated and it's very colorful kind and it's like, very yeah, impassioned. you were telling me, uh, what, uh, <laughs> punk math? Oh, Punk Mathematics, <laughs> the anarchist math book. Yeah. <laughs> Ray, Ray, I always say, he, he can pull a quote out of anywhere, you know. And, uh, but uh, when you were talking about math, what was that you were saying that they have, it's kind of a Kickstarter project that this guy has, uh, but the velocity of a brick. Uh... <laughs> so, yeah, it, this guy had an idea to do an anarchist math book. And instead of doing things like if a train leaves the station at 6.15 in the morning and it's going to New York so many miles away, they use things like if a brick hits a window at such and such velocity <laughs> and such and such an angle, what is the approximate <laughs> foot pounds of energy? You know, it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole new way of looking at math. Yeah, and, if the black uh, block leaves Pioneer Square, you know, at, at noon and the police riot squad starts moving at 1130, what time will they intersect on 4th and Burnside? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> 
I love that. Good I mean, math. Good math that people should think about. <laughs> it's, it's, and Ray, Ray, I'll tell you, he can get you laughing because he's, he can come up with these things from everywhere <laughs> and he remembers everything. And since you remember everything, I mean, you had you wrote some poetry and uh, some songs and stuff. Do you mm -hmm. want to you want to recite anything uh, that kind of gives a feeling? If I can remember, let me think. <clears throat> uh, I sometimes want to die. Colorful language deleted. <laughs> Lock and load. Just say goodbye. But the muzzle is not my friend because it's not me that should come to an end. For the war is vast with no end in sight, and I can't seem to stop it, try as I might. But the fight is alluring, and it's just what I do for all these young women and men who've yet to go through that system of violence, brutality, and abuse. Sometimes I'm suicidal, and people ask me why. But I tell them not to worry, because I'm not the one that deserves to die. Wow. That's, uh, that's what I mean. It's, it's just incredible. Uh, these are the th these are the kinds of things that happen from veterans getting together and telling their stories, and then try to write them and put them down. Mm -hmm. uh, it means so much for us to express ourselves, but we need other people to see it and to hear it. And that's why, uh, if you're interested in finding out about this film, uh, we're gonna okay, we're we're gonna. Uh, just, just go to Veterans for Peace or, or contact me at djshea at hotmail.com and I'll let you know because we're going to try and uh, get a screening here uh, in Portland. I want to remind people that I'm doing a, a screening of The Welcome, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is a similar thing that Ray went through uh, that will be at uh, uh, Cedar Mills uh, <clears throat> Library. And uh, if you want more information about that, just contact me and we'll let you know that. Ray, I wanted to thank you for coming in today, like always. Brother. Love you, Dan. You know, you're uh, you're one of those veterans that is uh, making a difference, I think, for other veterans, and you know, it's it's important, and I want more and more people to see what you're doing. And we Ray also got. Ray forgot his guitar because he could have <laughs> left us uh, with a rollout here with a nice, wonderful song. <laughs> you got a song in mind just so you can sing just off the top of your head as we kind of roll out? Dead politicians, not dead soldiers. Dead politicians, and these wars will be over. Dead politicians, not dead soldiers. Dead politicians, so these wars can be over. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Dan. <laughs>